it's Bobby's intensive meditation Sutta course. <laughs> so it's his his kind of schedule. He really kind of packs it in there. So it's his. Uh, so uh, I think one of the things that you all can do if you want to, if you have any feedback after the course, if it is too intensive or not enough, yeah, if you want more sessions per day, if you want six instead of four. So <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking. It, always nice to get feedback from the participants, yeah, so you get some idea whether it is right or not. Uh, so uh, just letting you know that. I'm sure Bobby will be very happy to get some feedback. Is that right, Bobby? Am I talking, saying the right thing? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. So let us now come back to the uh, sutta we were talking about before uh, the lunch. So, um, and uh, uh, so this again uh, is the idea of right view. Yeah. So we have just looked at the idea of generosity, and I, I don't know. I think these simple teachings, like the teachings on the generosity, these are actually very important because they are very practical and it teaches you something about how to live your ordinary life yeah because these are simple things that we can do all the time all the time uh, dhamma practice is not something you do only when you go on retreat or when you come back in the evening after work or whatever dhamma practice is a continuous thing we do all the time we integrate it into our lives and then it becomes powerful and useful uh, this is the best way to think about dhamma so uh, for this reason i I don't know, I, I sort of enjoy these simple little teachings and often think that they more kind of um, speak more directly to you than some of the more theoretical things. I actually kind of like both, but uh, these things are often more uh, powerful in a sense. So let us continue with this. So having looked at uh, uh, there, there is meaning in giving, sacrifice and offerings, uh, the next one is that it's fruits and results of good and bad deeds. Uh, so this fruits and results, this fruit is uh, uh, is pala, result is vipaka, yeah, pala vipaka, good and bad deeds is, I better look at the pali here because uh, I have it so I, uh, I should use it. Um, yeah, so sukata dukkatanang kamanang, well done and badly done actions, kamma, yeah, kamma anang, pala vipaka of these things. So, so uh, this is all about the Buddhist idea of kamma, that we have results from how we act, yeah, and this of course is a very important part of the Buddhist idea of right view. What we do matters enormously for our progress on the spiritual path. Every action matters. Uh, every time you kind of head in the wrong way, you do something which isn't quite right, it kind of pulls you, it kind of takes you one step back on the spiritual path. Uh, so if you're able to continuously do the right thing, have the right intention, every time it means you're taking one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. Uh, and as the, I think this is an ancient Chinese saying, a th uh, what is a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step? Is, is that a Chinese saying? Yeah? Uh, okay. Sometimes you don't know, you hear these things and it turns out to be something else, but uh, so that is probably right attribution then. So, uh, yeah, so every time, but every time you, t you know, you take one step in the wrong direction, uh, then it is uh, no longer a journey, then it's a journey of a thousand miles and then one step further away all of a sudden. So suddenly it's a journey of a thousand miles and one step. Yeah, so you try to avoid that because it just means another step forward in the future. Uh, so it, this is how you remind yourself of the importance of these things. What does it mean, this idea of kamma viparka? And um, it's again, it's very important to distinguish between how we talk about kamma viparka in kind of ordinary um, popular Buddhism, if you like, yeah, how it is often talked about in Buddhist societies and how we think about these things. That is one way, but how we apply it in Dhamma practice, if you are serious about Dhamma practice, actually often turns out to be quite different. Uh, the typical way of thinking about Kamma Vipaka when you talk in popular Buddhism is that you do acts now of kindness and then in your next life you reap some result. Yeah. So they will say, oh yeah, give it to the Sangha, because then in your next life you get this and you get that. Uh, what would you like to have in your next life? N not sure? 
<laughs> maybe you wouldn't want to have a next life at all, maybe, yeah? So maybe, maybe that's kind of... Uh, no more next life, are you sure? You had enough, enough of this life already? <laughs> okay, sometimes people say that, I don't want a next life, but then they think, oh, but do I want to really cease? Is that what I want? So I'm not so sure about that one either sometimes, yeah? It's kind of a hard, you don't really want to be reborn, but you're not sure if not being reborn is any better. You know what I mean? It's hard to choose, right? <laughs> so, what, what do we want? And most people, they have an idea what they want. They want a big mansion. Yeah? Do you want a big mansion? It's a lot of hassle to have a big mansion. Yeah, all those rooms. There was a nice story many years ago, I think. Usually it's Ajahn Brahm who points out these nice stories. This was a story from England, and England is a country full of big mansions. Have you been to England? Yeah? And you go into the countryside, you get these enormous mansions sometimes with you know, so many rooms. And there was a family, they lived in London, they lived in one of these very small houses. In London you have very small houses. Uh, and uh, they kind of, when you live in these houses, you live a bit on top of each other. Yeah, you kind of you, uh, you hear everyone else in the house, and it's, it's like having a small, like having a flat, I suppose, or something like that. Uh, and so this family, a very ordinary English family, didn't have much money or anything like that. Uh, and then they won the lottery. It was one of those big lotteries, ten million pounds or something like that. Uh, yeah, and of course, when you do that, you can buy all your dreams. Uh, and that's when you find out how stupid your dreams were in the first place. This is the interesting thing about our dreams, they're often so stupid. Yeah, they, they don't really make any sense when you think about it. We just don't understand how stupid our dreams are very often. So what is it, the old saying is that be careful what you wish for because you might just get it. Yeah, so wishing for things is dangerous because if you get it, it turns out to be much, much worse than you thought it would be. So this family in England, 10 million pounds, okay, it's a lot of money, okay, we can buy a big mansion for 10 million pounds. Well, maybe not super big, but kind of medium-sized mansion, yeah? Still, mansion is quite large, so they buy this mansion. And uh, then, after a few months, they uh, move back into the small house again. And then people ask them, how come? You finally got your dreams, you got this enormous mansion, yeah? And then they said, well, why, is, why did you move back again? And they said, well, when we're living in this mansion, the kind of the mum and dad were living in one wing of the mansion, the children were living in another wing of the mansion, we never saw each other, it was so big. It was like we were too far apart, we didn't want to live like that anymore, so they moved back into the house so they could be closer together. <laughs> is that a sweet story? And Life is often like that. We have these ideas about what life should be like. We have these desires for the future, desires for a big house, a nice car. It also has consequences that we're not aware of when we get those things. Imagine being born as a king somewhere, or a queen, the other king of England or queen of England, Charles, and imagine what it's like to be in that position. Do you think it's any fun to be the queen of England? probably terrible, yeah, you are completely locked in, you can't do anything that you want to do. You are kind of, from the moment you're born, this is your role, this is what you have to do. If you want to be a Buddhist nun, do you think that's easy if you are the Queen of England? <laughs> Difficult, you can't say, okay, this is it, I don't want to be the Queen anymore, I want to be a Buddhist nun. You can't do that, yeah, if you are <laughs> the Queen of England, you are born, you are the head of the Anglican Church. There's no chance for you to become a Buddhist nun or a Buddhist monk. And you have to follow the strict regimen, you have to live in Buckingham Palace, you can't even choose your house. Okay, Buckingham Palace is quite a nice house, but still, if you don't like it, you can't choose. It's too large, I want to move into a small flat. Please, can I move into a small flat? No, you have to stay in Buckingham Palace. That's how it works. So it's important to sometimes to break out of those silly dreams that we have. The vast majority of people have that. And when they make good karma, they make it with those dreams and ideas in their mind. And very often, because they have those dreams, it kind of just carries on into the future, carries on into the future. Uh, there is a nice, uh, I, one of the suttas I always read out on these retreats, I can't remember if I have included it here or not, I can't remember what is included here anymore, but one of the suttas is called the Potalia Sutta. And it, is it in here? It's okay, I always include it. So anyway, I'll give you a preview of the Potalia Sutta. And in the Potalia Sutta, it talks about sensual pleasures uh, and says sensual pleasures are like a 
dream. Yeah, they are like a dream. When you dream about things, everything seems so beautiful in your dream. But then when you wake up, it's all gone. And sensual pleasures are a bit like that. We're always looking at the future, projecting into the future, trying to think what things will be like. But when we get there, when we wake up to the reality, it is far less interesting yeah, than we think. Do you know what I mean? You kind of you have this dream about a certain relationship, and finally you get the relationship. You think, big deal. Actually, it was a mistake. Yeah, <laughs> you know how that is sometimes. You don't really. We don't know who we get married to. We don't know who our boyfriends or girlfriend who they really are. One of the interesting things I look at my own sister and brother. Yeah, these are very. They are good people. They are educated. They have everything in life really, uh, they can't really complain about anything. Uh, and then I, then I get married uh, and I think, is that the sort of marriage I would want? Uh, not really. <laughs> I, not that I want to get married, but if I were to choose you know, someone to get married to, would, I really, would that be the kind of thing I would be interested in? I look at my sister, she, I think for, to my opinion she chose some very strange uh, <laughs> you know, one husband and one boyfriend. I wonder how did she get, well actually one of them was very nice, the other one was really weird. And I wonder how, how, how does this happen? And then I look at my brother's marriage, how, how he ended up choosing his wife. And he didn't really choose his wife as much as just kind of, it just happens, yeah? You meet somebody and suddenly one day you're just married. You think, whoops, I'm married now, what happened? You know, that this, this is kind of things that sort of happen around you and then it's not really your choice almost. Uh, and then I look at the relationship, I think, I wouldn't want to be married. It just, she's probably just an ordinary girl, nothing wrong with her, but would I want that kind of relationship? No way. And it, if I hadn't been a monk, if I had chosen to have a relationship instead, would I have been any smarter than my brother and sister to find the right person? I'd probably be more stupid. Yeah. I think back to some of my university days. I, you know, I, I went through a couple of relationships with girlfriends before I became a monk, and how, how stupid I was in the way I, you know, choose <laughs> these relationships. And I realize it is so. We are so bad at making these choices. We don't really understand what we're doing. We look at all the silly, superficial things. Don't really look deeply enough. The people we should choose as a life partner would never choose. We should choose the wise ones, but we choose the stupid ones or whatever. Yeah. So when I, when I see all of that, I, you realize it's the dream is one thing. The reality actually is so hard. Uh, it's so difficult to get these things right. Almost nobody gets it right. Uh, we all think that we are smarter than everyone else, but we are just like everyone else. Uh, we are no wiser in getting the right relationship. Uh, I don't know wh what you think. Yeah, what do you <laughs> anyway, I'm being, getting a bit sidetracked probably, but uh, so the point is that uh, when we think about Kama Vipaka, we have to think about it in the right way. This is really the point I'm trying to make here. Don't think about the future, what it will give you, uh, because the future is so uncertain anyway. And as uh, I said before, you don't really know whether you want those things. Uh, down the track you may realize it was a mistake in the first place. Uh, so Kamavipaka, one of the interesting things about Kamavipaka is that the Buddha says there's three kinds of ripening. Yeah? Vipaka means to ripen. Three kinds of ripening of Kama. Kama ripens in this very life. Yeah? Dita Dhamma, Kamavipaka if you like. It ripens in your next rebirth or it ripens further down the track somewhere, further down in some life beyond, beyond this. And uh, the ripening in your next life or lives beyond is, it's nice. Yeah, it's nice to know that you're going to have a nice rebirth or whatever. It's nice to know that you will be happy in the future. But it is sort of, uh, okay, it's nice, but it doesn't really make all that much difference in this particular life. So the Kama Vipaka we should focus on, what really makes the most sense, is to think about, focus on the Kama Vipaka in this life. Because in this life, if you live, do the right kind of karma, it will support your spiritual practice. Yeah? In this sense it will be very powerful and incredibly useful. Uh, and that's why we should make the most possible karma as we can in this life. Uh, there is a sutta where the Buddha talks to the monks uh, and he says to the monks, don't be afraid of punya, boon, boon in Bali, punya. 
Yeah, because punya is a term for happiness. And happiness is one of the foundational things that is required for the spiritual path. We've seen this already. When you meditate, there has to be a degree of happiness there. We all want to be happy. If you're going to have a joyful life or whatever, this is the way to do it. It will help your ability to live well. It will help the meditation. Ultimately, it will help the insight and awakening experiences as well. <coughs> So this is what we should be looking for, that result in this particular life. And, uh, and you can tell, actually you can tell, if you are careful and you observe carefully, you can tell whether you are making good karma right here, right now. How do you know that? It's very easy really. If you do an act of kindness towards somebody, if you really are coming from a kind heart, yeah, if you, I really want to help you. I want to say something kind to you. You don't say this, you just feel that way. And then you do an act of kindness towards somebody else. If you do it in the right way, it feels good. You know what I mean? <coughs> it feels nice when you are really kind to somebody else. Feel that, experience that, because when you see that, that is where you get incredible, incredible motivation to be kind in this life. Also try to experience that when you do something which is not kind, yeah, you kind of, you talk a bit too fast or whatever it is, uh, very often you don't feel bad about yourself as a consequence. Uh, try to experience that as well. Try to feel the connection between your intention and how you feel about yourself. That is what karma really is. The karma is the connection between intention and how you feel about yourself. And that can be felt right here, right now. This is the karma in the present life. I like to kind of emphasize this all the time because it is so important. Because once you see that connection, and sometimes you will see it very strongly, a lot of the time you won't see it so strongly. Once you see that, you get a very powerful motivation for living well. Because you can feel the difference it makes to live well compared to living badly. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, this is the Kamma in this life, yeah? And this is what we should be focusing on. And that is the karma that really matters. It is the immediate feeling you have when you live well and when you avoid living badly. Yeah? And uh, this kind of experience of karma is what really matters. Uh, okay, you might get the BMW in your next life as well. That's like a bonus. That BM does the BMW is a bonus in your next life. Uh, but it is the experience of happiness here and now that really matters. Uh, and that is the one that we should be looking for. Huh? And then we are on the right track. Huh? This is the main thing about Kama. The other thing that I mentioned before is that uh, to always keep in mind is that Kama is not everything. Yeah? Often we think that we kind of complain about my Kama is so bad, I'm experiencing, I lost my job, what did I do wrong in the past uh, to lose my job? But it doesn't work like that. Uh, so we cannot blame everything on kamma, and that is a good thing. The Buddha specifically says in the suttas, if everything was pubba katta hetu, pubba katta hetu means, um, pubba means before, katta done, hetu, rooted, or based, yeah, if everything was based on what was done in the past, uh, there is no living of the spiritual life. Uh, because if everything is everything we experienced comes from past karma, then everything is already locked into place. Karma has already decided everything. Uh, so there is no way out. If everything is pubba, pubbe katta hetu, as it says, I think this is in the um, Tenets Sutta, the Anguttara 3 is number 61. Uh, so that is not how Buddhism works. A lot of the things that we experience in life are just because of circumstances, uh, the way our life turns out. Uh, yeah, we are reborn as human beings, uh, and if you are a human being, then you can expect certain things. Uh, is there anyone here who is not a human being? Uh, so, sometimes you don't know. It could be a Naga disguised as a human being. Uh, this is a Sutta. This is from the Vinaya Pitaka. Yeah? You are a Naga disguised as a human being. So if you are a Naga, then it may be different, so you can come and talk to me afterwards. But if you are a human being, then uh, this is how it works. Uh, so there's all these other things that decide our life. Yeah? Even if you get very ill, even if you have a short life, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have done past bad karma in the past. Uh, short life can come for many reasons. One of them is karma, but karma is not the only reason why your life may be short. Uh, 
serious illness, all of these things, sometimes they happen because we are human beings, not because of karma. And this is one of those things, and very not usually understood. And you may say, well, what does it say then? If you go to Majjhimanikaya 135, the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the analysis, the shorter analysis on karma, in, if you read that sutta, it says that if you kill, you can expect a short life. Doesn't that mean that if you have a short life, you must have but done bad karma? No. What it says is that if you kill, in, then you can expect a short life. It doesn't say all short life comes from killing. Only one reason for short life is killing. There may be other reasons as well. So you have to read sometimes very carefully to s get these things right. So, and this kind of, you know, in one way what this means is that uh, uh, life is much more unpredictable than we think. We cannot really control life. Uh, yeah, very often people come and they ask exactly this question, oh, I have lost my job, or my wife les left me, or my husband left me, or uh, my someone died in my family. What bad karma have I done to deserve this? Uh, People often ask these questions, yeah? Especially if you are a monk, they come to you, oh, what did I do in the past? And then I'm supposed to read their mind. Zzzz, boom. Okay, you did this. Tick. Now, okay, sort it. Huh? What are you going to do if I tell you what you did anyway? Are you going to say, oh yeah, okay, now? Well, the reason why people want to know these things is because they want to be in control of their life. So if they think that now I know the reason why I had this bad result, then now I can avoid that same thing in the future, so I can av avoid that result in the future. This is the kind of thinking, yeah? Once you understand all the bad causes, you can avoid them, and it feels like you are in control of your life. But really, that's the wrong way of thinking about it, uh, yeah? Because in the end, you're not going to be able to be in control of your life in that way, Anyway, because life is just too complex, uh, there's too many causes, even if it was true that this was the cause, which it isn't, uh, even if it was true, you wouldn't be able to control it, you wouldn't be able to use it in a good way to control things for the future, because karma is too complicated. Uh. So it's the wrong way, it's the wrong question to ask, uh, yeah, why did I, what did I do to deserve this outcome? Uh? Rather, the right question to ask is how should I live from now on, what is the lesson to learn from this? And if you learn a lesson from the dukkha, from the suffering, then you are on the right track. Yeah? And that is the right way of thinking about this. So, kamma is uh, more complicated and more kind of diverse than we think it is. Uh, the main thing that kamma does is guide us from one life to the next one. Uh, and it decides where you get reborn. Uh, the actual contents I within one life is much more complex. Some of it may be due to karma, but a lot of it is just due to that particular rebirth that you have. Human beings can expect certain things, uh, and then you get those things as a consequence. There is a, um, if you're more interested in the idea of karma, uh, you can, uh, there is a, uh, online there is a course that I did with uh, Ajahn Sujato many years ago called Kamma and Rebirth in Early Buddhism, yeah, where we have a number of myths, kamma myths, that we kind of debunk, debunking myths. That was one of the kind of, when we have a bit of fun together, <laughs> you're going to debunk some myths, so we, all of, we go through all of these things. You can find that online if you're interested in having a look at that. We talk about many of these issues uh, uh, that are often misunderstood uh, in terms of kamma in Buddhism. So, uh, but the main thing is just to try to understand the kamma in the present life how it affects you here and now. And if you do, then you are really on the right track with uh, uh, the idea of karma. That is really what it is about. Uh. Does anyone want to say anything about karma before I move on to the next topic? Yeah. It's a big topic in Buddhism, and we could talk a lot about it, but I'm going to keep it relatively simple. Uh. Yes, Sing <laughs> Chao. Yeah. I had uh, been to online uh, forums and there's this one commentator that says uh, karma is entirely mind-made so he doesn't believe that uh, arahants after he attained and like uh, someone attained and determined as arahant they are still subject to their karma They're still subject to karma? Huh? He doesn't believe that because he believes that the karma is a story mm. that's entirely mind-made 
and uh, once the self is seen to be not really that, know that, then there will be no more chain, nothing to chain the karma. So he doesn't believe in the results. Okay. The previous yeah. karma that happens to arahant also. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so is a kam is an arahant subject to karma? Yeah, uh, yeah. I would argue based on in yeah. Sutta texts that they are. Uh-huh. And that karma is not yeah. entirely mind, but also physical, right? Uh, whether you're beautiful or ugly is also based on karma. Yeah, mm. yeah. All of this because I mean, mm. this distinction between the physical and the mental, anyway, it's like a it's like a red herring. It's not really real. Yeah, the physical, and mental are just two aspects of the same larger reality, really. Anyway, so I don't think you can make that distinction. But uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think you know whether that is true or not. Okay, maybe. I, I don't know what the answer is, uh, and I think you, I would tend to agree with you that uh, an arahant is still subject to karma. But one of the things is also that if you're an arahant, your karma will be very diluted anyway, yeah, yeah diluted to the maximum. Uh, and that is one of those famous similes about karma in the sutras, the, the, the grain of salt, which you would you would know about, uh, right? Uh, and uh, does everyone know about the similar the grain of salt in the sutras? Yeah, everyone knows this already. You are so educated in this uh, <laughs> BGF. Uh. So. Uh, yeah, so because of that, at this point, when around you have the Ga- whole Ganges River, yeah, the whole, and if you put that little lump of salt in the Ganges River, well, it's not going to taste bad at all. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So that is just very briefly about the fruit and results of good and bad deeds. Then there is the uh, next one is there is an afterlife. And uh, the Pali for that is Atti, Atti Ayang Loko, Atti Para Loko. There is this world and there is the other world. Uh, this is a standard way of talking about the idea of rebirth, yeah, that we move from one world to another one. Uh, and this is kind of the idea here of rebirth. So rebirth is one of the aspects of right view in Buddhism. This is the way the world operates. It operates through rebirth. And uh, it is a very important idea in Buddhism. In case you have any doubt, you probably don't have any doubt, but if there, um, some people think that the idea of rebirth is irrelevant, it doesn't really matter, but actually it matters enormously as far as I can see. Yeah. And it matters so much because we've just been looking at the first noble truth, uh, and in the first noble truth it says that the five khandas are dukkha, panchupadana khanda dukkha, and if the five khandas are dukkha, then of course rebirth is a problem because rebirth is just a continuation of the five khandas. Uh, that's really what it is. Uh, so you are propelling, projecting those khandas into the future, carrying them on. Uh, so if there is rebirth, then you are also, what, I- what is really getting reborn is dukkha. Yeah? It is dukkha that you are propelling into the future in this way. Uh, suffering. Uh, suffering gets reborn. That's the five khandas. Uh, so rebirth matters enormously here, yeah, and uh, it is a very important part of the Buddhist path. And I think if you read the suttas uh, properly, I find it very hard to see how you can really argue against the idea of rebirth, or that the Buddha didn't teach that. It is everywhere. Yeah. It is so fundamental to the understanding of so many categories in Buddhism. It is in all the Four Noble Truths, it is in dependent origination, it is in the uh, enlightenment experience, you have ended rebirth, that is in the right view that we're looking at here. It is everywhere throughout the suttas. If you take out rebirth, you're taking out one of the pillars of Buddhism. One of the things that holds it up, that makes it kind of congeal, that gives it an integrity, gives it a completeness, that makes the puzzle of Dhamma hold together into one picture. If you take out this thing out of the Dhamma picture, the whole thing kind of cracks open and you have to reassemble the picture from scratch because one of the pillars has been taken out. And when you reassemble the picture from scratch, it looks like a very different thing. It doesn't look like the Dhamma anymore. It looks like, what does it look like? Adhamma, Adhamma maybe, yeah, the non-Dhamma, some kind of non-Dhamma, that's what it looks like. And uh, Adhamma, yeah, the, the, maybe the vi, Vidhamma, the Vidhamma, vi, Adhamma, something like that. Yeah. And um, so it is so fundamental and everything needs to be 
reinterpret it. Uh, you have to reinterpret dependent ori origination. You have to reinterpret the goal of Buddhism, what it means to be enlightened. Yeah, all of these things need to be changed uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, so it's very problematic to take rebirth out of the Dhamma. It doesn't really work. Uh, and uh, I have seen s a number of very scary examples of people trying to do that uh, and then rewriting the whole Tipitaka and coming out with a new Tipitaka based on their interpretation of these things. Uh, it doesn't look like Buddhism anymore, it looks like something else. Uh, I shall not say any names because uh, it might not be such a good idea, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it happens in this world. Uh. So there is rebirth and it is matters enormously in Buddhism. Uh. Now let's go to the next one. Uh. There is obligation to mother and father. Yeah. And uh, this, this one and the next one are perhaps the two things that are the strangest in the idea of right view. Uh, yeah, Atti, the Pali just says, uh, Atti Mata, Atti Pita, there is mother, there is father. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, why is this included in right view? Uh, yeah, mother and father, okay, sure, they, they are important and all of that, but, uh, and the reason they are included in right view is because they are actually much more important than we think. That's why it is there. Yeah, and this makes it very, that's why it is so interesting that it actually exists in the idea of right view. And when you start to know your suttas quite well, and many of you will know these things already, you know that there are some expressions in the suttas uh, about the importance of mother and father and the kind of kamma that we make in that connection. Uh, and that is really in the connection of kamma, making kamma, that this thing comes into its own and it starts to really make sense. So, for example, the suttas say that if you kill your mother and father, uh, that is an that is an antaraya kadama that blocks you from having a good rebirth in the future. Huh? You have to have a really bad rebirth as a consequence of that. Huh? If you want to ordain as a monk or a nun, huh? if you have killed your mother and father, you cannot ordain. You are blocked from ordaining. Huh? Yeah, mother or father or arahant. Yeah, kill one of those three and then you can't ordain. Huh? So how do we know who the arahants are if you kill somebody? Maybe they were an arahant. How do you know? That's, that's a good question. I'm not sure how you know. But maybe you have to ask them before you kill them. Are you an arahant? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, not sure. But still, it is interesting because what it means is that mother and father here are on the same level as the arahant. Yeah, you kill your parents is the same as killing an arahant. That gives you some idea of how bad it is and the significance of that kamma. So it means that how we treat our parents uh, has very powerful kamma in our life. And for that reason, if we treat our parents well, we can make good kamma quickly. We can change, turn our lives around very quickly. And if we treat our parents badly, we can actually do something very detrimental to our spiritual progress. Uh, this, is, this is why, this is what makes this so interesting. Uh, yeah, and wh why it actually matters so much. Uh, so, how can we treat our parents well? And uh, sometimes people say, oh, but you know, I have such a difficult relationship with my parents, you know, I, you know it's so hard to treat them well. I, you know, true, sometimes people have very difficult relationships with their parents. Uh, so sometimes you do your best. Uh, you improve things a little bit. Uh, you do a little bit to move in the right direction. You may not have the perfect, loving relationship with your parents, that's okay. You cannot put things are not perfect, but at least you're moving it a little bit in the right direction. Uh, try to forgive things from the past uh, and try to move on from things that happened before. And just by doing a little bit, uh, you're already doing a lot uh, to get these things in the right direction. Uh. So the Buddha says a few things about parents, and one of the things that he says about parents, he says that they are the pubacharya. Uh. He says they are like Brahma. Uh. Yeah, Pubacharya means like the uh, uh, the first teachers uh, that we have. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is a very nice reflection to do uh, to remind yourself of the importance of your parents in this life, all the things they have taught you. Uh, yeah, over so many years, from when you were tiny, 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 everything you learned before you went to school were taught by your parents. 
They taught you how to eat, how to get dressed, how to wash yourself, how to, you know, all of these basic things that we take for granted, uh, our parents taught us. Uh, because when you are a small child, you are completely dependent on your parents. Uh, and when you think back at all that, uh, you know, all the time that the parents have kind of spent on you, all the patience they've had, yeah, when you were a, a small child, uh, you were kind of, we all, everyone's crying sometimes when you, ha when you are a baby, uh, and your parents kind of looking after you. Uh, and the more you think about that, uh, the more sense you think, yeah, they did a lot for me. Uh, what an amazing thing that is. Even the worst of parents, they were, you know, have done a lot for you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh. So it's kind of amazing. And once you start to think like that, uh, you start to get a sense of gratitude. Uh, yeah? Without our parents, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be able to live. Uh, we wouldn't survive even for a day without parents. Uh. And uh, this is why parents are, in a sense, on the same level as the Arahant, uh, because they are such important teachers in our life. Uh, the Arahant is able to teach us the Dhamma, the Buddha can teach us the Dhamma, which gives meaning to life, which makes life makes a massive difference. Uh, our parents are similar, because they are the ones that make life possible in the first place. Uh, so in this way, by thinking about your parents in the right way, you start to have a sense of gratitude for what they did. Uh, actually, they did a lot. They weren't perfect. They made mistakes. Uh, we had arguments. There were pro always, there's always problems in family life. Uh, but uh, still, regardless of all those negative things, they did a lot of positive. Uh, and this is one of those very important things when we uh, reflect about the world and we reflect about the people, is the ability to shift your attention away from the negative and remember the positive. Uh, yeah, this is kind of this is what meta is all about: the ability to uh, forgive the negative things and build up the positive perception. Remember the good things and people around you. Uh, that is where meta arises. That's when you feel friendly towards people. You feel a sense of kindness towards them because you remember the good qualities. Uh, and we can do that also with our parents. Uh, this is how you do that. Uh. The other thing the Buddha says is that the uh, our parents are like Brahma. Brahma is the uh, highest god uh, in the kind of Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddhist kind of idea of the universe. Uh, to get reborn as a Brahma, you have to have loving kindness. Yeah, you have to have deep samadhi and universal loving kindness. So when the Buddha says that your parents are like Brahma, what he means is that it, your parents have metta towards you. They have compassion for you. Huh? Yeah, they always forgive you. Huh? At the end of the day, they might get upset with you, but at the end of the day, they love you, huh? and they will look after you. Huh? And it's kind of amazing. Nobody else in the whole world would put up with some of these little children. Huh? The only person who puts up with this, some of these naughty children is the parents. Yeah? Everyone else would kind of give up a long time ago. Huh? But your parents always look after you, and they are there. So they have this immense patience with you, coming from this metta, this metta which almost never uh, gives up, uh, stops, uh, and is always th that eternal ability and willingness to forgive uh, is one of the expressions of that metta. So they are like Brahma. Huh? So remember that, yeah? I, the weaknesses of your parents, don't dwell on the weaknesses. Uh, it is so easy to think of the faults in, in ourselves and other people, including our parents. Uh, there's so much positive there. Huh? so much there which is worthy of celebrating uh, and to kind of bring up. Uh, and when you think that your parents are like Brahma, Brahma is something very beautiful. Uh, this universal kind of love uh, where everyone is included, uh, that is what Brahma is like. Uh, and our parents are a bit like that. Uh, always willing to forgive. Uh, this is the idea of the mother, the way the mother loves her only child. Uh, this is what it is all about. Uh. So think a bit like that because uh, it is often the case that people think that our obligations to our parents can be a burden. Yeah, and I know that this, this maybe happens especially in some of the East Asian societies because of the idea of filial piety may be stronger here than in other parts of the world. So people think sometimes, oh, it's, it's a burden, it's too much, there are too many, I always have to do what they say and all these kind of things. So try not to think like that. Uh, try not to make it into a burden. Because if you make it into a, if it becomes a burden for you, then you lose some of the ability to make good karma out of it. Uh, try to look at it in a different way. Uh, look at it as in a positive way, so you can actually uh, express that sense of gratitude and kindness instead. Uh, 
That is far more useful. It is much better not to spend so much time with your parents and instead spend quality time rather than to spend a lot of time and then feeling negative about it. Uh, yeah, I said I'm a Buddhist monk, so I don't spend much time with my parents, but I, I go back to, I try to go back to Norway once a year. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, uh, that, to me, that's, that's a lot already. Once a year to me seems like a lot. Uh, and um, I don't know, in, I think in Norwegian society it's quite different because in Norwegian society you kind of you become independent very quickly. As soon as you're 18 years old, you kind of leave the house. Yeah, okay, enough. Now I start my own kind of life. So you don't have so much of that contact, but still it's important to do that. So that is parents, yeah? So see what you can do in that area. Just showing kindness, showing care, showing all of these things. And if you do that in the right way, you will build up something very positive inside of you. And also, you will go to your parents' hearts. Yeah, Your, your parents will tend to open up. Your parents will become more interested in Dhamma, perhaps. You often hear this question, oh, how can I get my parents to become more interested in Dhamma? I hear this question a lot. And, pe and people, I don't know what they expect, maybe they expect me to quote a sutta, read this sutta to them, then they will become Buddhist straight away. No, it, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Uh, so the, <laughs> the way to make your parents Buddhist is to inspire them through your own actions. This is by far the most powerful thing here. So if you can show that you are living the good Buddhist life, then things will actually start to happen. Uh, and I know that from personal experience, uh, yeah, because that's what happened in my life. Uh, I don't know, you, I've told this story many times before, but when I became a Buddhist monk, my parents were not impressed. Uh, yeah, uh, like uh, Queen Elizabeth is not impressed. Uh, my parents were not impressed. Uh, and they said, what, where have we failed in the upbringing? <laughs> And, uh, which is very interesting, because I thought, oh yeah, okay, well, I, I don't think you have failed, but whatever, anyway. In fact, I think you have succeeded if you have a son who can become a Buddhist monk, even though you come from Norway, surely you have succeeded, because you have made someone who is independent, who can think for themselves and make wise choices. Yeah, they didn't even know how wise this choice was to become a Buddhist monk. Yeah, that was part of the problem. Huh? But uh, gradually, your parents come around, uh, if you treat them well, and that's what I realized very early on, my job is not to convert them by preaching about Buddhism to them, my job is to be kind to them. Uh, and that goes to your parents' hearts, uh, and when it goes to their hearts, if you do this again and again and again, uh, after a while they start to take an interest, uh, they wonder what's going on. Uh, yeah. And uh, my parents, eventually, they pretty much became Buddhists. And this is kind of a revolution, because they started off being very anti what I was doing. They thought I was just kind of going into this cult, yeah, and becoming brainwashed. Well, they were right about that. I did get brainwashed, but it was a good kind of brainwashing, yeah? We all get brainwashed anyway, so they had something right, but not quite, quite right. Uh, and until, eventually, they started to realize that these teachings are very powerful. Yeah, our son is changing. He used to be a bit of a kind of rebellious teenager. Now he's kind of nice. What, what happened? These teachings must be good. Yeah? If he's nice to us, must be good teachings. That's kind of the conclusion that parents make. And uh, eventually, they, I would say, they were Buddhist. Uh, my father was a Buddhist pretty much before he died. He listened to Buddhist teachings. Whenever I went back to Norway, he would say, give us a Dhamma talk, let's sit down and meditate together. Uh, and, he, uh, and all of these things. Uh, yeah? And that is kind of Astonishing to see the turnaround that happened. It took a long time, 10, 15 years it took, but eventually it happens. And um, uh, my father would sometimes, they would go to church because they were living in Norway. They weren't really Christian, but they would just go to church, I don't know, social reasons or whatever it is. And he said, as always, he said, it's so boring to go to church. They have nothing to talk about. Yeah? It's, why can't they be more like the Buddhists? <laughs> That's what he said to me. Yeah, the Buddhist teachings are interesting. This kind of Christian church teaching are pointless and meaningless. Uh, or maybe it was just the priests who were hopeless at, at teaching. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, so, and this kind of that contrast yeah, was just very, very interesting and very powerful. Uh, and this is how things then turn out uh, when you uh, can turn out anyway when you get it right. Uh. So, let's. <coughs> 
Let's move on to the next one here. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously here. O Papatika Sattva. And um, this is a strange one, and I think it only exists in the Pali versions of the suttas. It does not exist in the, some of the other versions of the sutta, in Chinese translation or whatever. I think it is almost unique to the Pali. So what is the point? Why is this in there? This is the sort of thing that you always wonder. Yeah, there must be a reason why it is there. The, with the Buddha, nothing is random. This is one of the things about the suttas. Everything is structured. Everything has a very precise sequence. Things are there for a reason. Yeah? Otherwise, that's not, the Buddha just doesn't do things randomly. So, why is it there? And I think the reason it, why it is there is because uh, this, remember what we're talking about now, a lot of the context here is kamma and rebirth, right? Uh, so if, rebo if people can be, or if beings can be reborn spontaneously, uh, it means that all kinds of other rebirths suddenly are possible. Uh, yeah, like a, de a deva, for example. Well, to be, to be a deva, you would have to be reborn spontaneously because you are this light being. You cannot be born in an ordinary way like human beings are. Uh, if you are going to be reborn in a hell realm, perhaps, also will have to be spontaneous because the way beings are born there is just different. Uh, so if you have this kind of body, which is different, it allows for different kinds of kamma to ripen. Uh, because a light body, like the devas have, will have a different properties from a human body. It will allow them to live longer, it will allow them to experience less pain and problems in the body, and more bliss and all of these kind of things. If you have a mind-made body in the hell realms, it's the same thing. You won't die so fast because it's mind-made. You, you arise spontaneously. So what it does, it expands out the potential of samsara. If you don't believe in spontaneous rebirth, well basically you are limiting yourself to the human realm and the animal realm, yeah? But once you accept the idea of spontaneous rebirth, you are expanding out the potential of samsara with all of these other kinds of beings. Uh, heavenly beings, uh, hell realm beings, the whole thing. Uh, and then uh, the idea of kamma vipaka and rebirth uh, expands also correspondingly because of that. Uh, and suddenly you start to understand the whole samsara, the whole samsaric existence. Uh, and you have to, if, you're gonna, if you are the Buddha and you're going to make a decision about suffering and happiness, uh, what is suffering in the world and what is happiness, uh, whether you should be enlightened or not, you have to understand the whole thing. Otherwise, if you don't understand the whole thing, you don't really understand the full range of suffering and happiness. You, don't you have to understand whether it's permanent or not. Uh, this is one of the things about kamma, why kamma is so important. Uh, because kamma shows you that everything is limited. Uh, you make a certain kamma to get reborn in a certain place, uh, but because kamma only is only so powerful, there's only so much of it, uh, that rebirth can only last so long. Uh, so kama means, in a sense, that everything is impermanent. Uh, you don't get reborn in the Brahma realm and you stay there forever after. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you get reborn in the Brahma realm and because of the fi uh, finitude, from whatever, what is it, the English word, fi finiteness of uh, kama, it takes only so long, then you cannot die from that realm and you get reborn again in the human realm as a consequence. Uh, so this is how all of these things kind of come together and you can understand the whole samsaric existence. Uh, and that, I think, is the reason why it is there. Uh. So, right view is to believe that there are spontaneously arisen beings, mind-made beings. Uh. Okay, last one of this kind of right view. Uh. And there are ascetics and Brahmins who are well attained and practiced uh, and who describe the afterlife after realizing it with their own insight. Uh, so, uh, who are well attained and practiced is very not very specific. Uh, the only specific thing here which is kind of interesting is the idea of an afterlife. Yeah? So a good ascetic and Brahmin who has been practicing in the right way, what they have realized is the idea that there is rebirth. Again, emphasizing rebirth. You can see how rebirth is here, comes again and again in various guises. Yeah? 
there we had before there is an afterlife, now we have again describing the afterlife. So a really good ascetic or Brahmin who practices well, that is how they are recognized by their ability to describe the afterlife. Rebirth is just so fundamental. Yeah, it comes in all of these various places again and again and again. Uh, so uh, you have to have faith in something. Uh, yeah, if you if you don't have faith that there are good ascetics and Brahmins who realize these things, uh, you won't have faith in the Buddha, perhaps. Uh, there is no. And if you don't have faith in the Buddha and that these beings exist or are possible, then there is no hope. Uh, yeah, you're not going to practice the Noble Eightfold Path unless you have some faith that these things can be realized. Uh, this is like a fundamental part of faith in Buddhism. Uh, you have to actually have faith in the Buddha, otherwise it doesn't start. Uh, how can you have faith in the Buddha? And uh, the, the, the answer to that is that uh, one of the important things is actually to study these suttas, uh, to read them, to see if they make sense to you, maybe to hear explanations of the suttas uh, and see how, what it feels like. Does it make sense? Some of it may make sense, some of it may seem a bit alien and strange, uh, yeah? But uh, overall, it gives a very a picture, at least for me it does this, it has an integrity to it. Uh, there is the w especially the way the path, so far we haven't looked much at the path, but the way the path of Buddhism is explained is actually very powerful, uh, and it makes sense, and you know it can be put into practice. Uh, and to me that is one of the things that gives the most faith in the Buddhist teaching, is just reading the path and understanding how it works, uh, and seeing how it applies to your own life. Uh, and then just seeing the Buddha in conversation with other people uh, and seeing how it deals with it and all of these things coming together to me gives a very strong picture that is very realistic uh, of some uh, powerful person uh, behind this. Uh, that is one part of it, understanding the suttas. Another part is to sometimes go and visit exceptional people, uh, go and visit Ajahn Ganha. Uh, as in, uh, how many of you have visited Ajahn Ganha? Has anyone, any of you seen visiting? Oh, there is a few of you. Was it, was it nice? You enjoyed it? Yeah? <laughs> okay. What did he say to you? Uh, can he, th he was throwing things at you. <laughs> that is one of the great experiences of visiting Ajahn Ganha. You kind of receive all of these things. Uh, blessings, yeah. When you, next time you go there, you, sh you should ask him some questions. Uh, yeah, go there, ask questions. Don't be afraid of. Uh, were you afraid when you met him? Very big group, okay. What if you went by yourself? Would you be afraid? <laughs> no? He's not a very frightening person, yeah? He's like a very small man and he's very overweight uh, and he sits there, has a large, usually sm a very, very kind of benign expression, very, sm very smiley expression on his face. Uh, he does, you don't feel very dangerous. Uh, the only, maybe very generous. Uh, and uh, you, do you have a feeling that he was reading your mind? Do you ever feel that? Uh, yes, you had that feeling, okay. So that's, in, that, that's a bit scary, right? But, but uh, generally speaking, you don't feel too scared. So next time you go there, make sure you ask some questions. Uh, because that is how you interact with a teacher like that, yeah? Because when I went there, it was very interesting, because when I went there, I went with a small group. And because I'm a monk, he looks after you. Huh? So I spent about 10 hours with Ajangana, just me and him, nobody else, kind of bang, yeah? And b also because I'm Ajahn Brahm disciple. So straight away, you're Ajahn Brahm disciple, okay, special, special guys, yeah? So when you go there, say, okay, yeah, I'm Ajahn Brahm disciple too. Then he may, maybe he will look after you. Huh? This is one of the trade, trade secrets when you visit Ajahn Ganha. <laughs> so, uh, but it's very interesting because to me, when I see people like that, it gives me this sense that the Buddhist path works. Here you see the metta, you see the peace, someone who never really gets flustered by anything, always cool, regardless of how many people there is, regardless of what is happening. The monks around him may be arguing, he just completely doesn't even see it, he completely ignores it, he's just so cool all the time, always kind. And it's astonishing when you see that. It opens up an eye. You see something which is unusual. Nobody is like that. Uh, yeah? And this brings the Dhamma alive precisely because you see something exceptional. Uh. So very useful to meet people like that who are different uh, from what you ordinarily see in ordinary life. Uh. 
So here's one of those. Another one who's very interesting is Lumpur Lim at, at uh, Wat Pat Pong. Yeah, the abbot there took over from, uh, from Ajahn Shah. And of course, we have uh, uh, my own favorite teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, he's pretty, pretty cool as well. Yeah. <laughs> so this brings these things alive. This is how you start to get faith in the Buddha. You see his teaching still working in the present day and you read the word and you see how it all fits together very beautifully in one uh, complete whole and it has integrity to it, it has power to it. Uh, and this matters and sometimes I feel so sorry for those people who are not capable of seeing the beauty in these teachings. Yeah, Sometimes you tell people, but you know, have a look at this. And they say, no, no, I want to I believe in this God instead. Uh, and I, and what can you say if someone is really committed to believing in God? Usually you can't say anything because they are so committed to it, they're not really ready to listen to anything else. And I sometimes I feel it's such a shame. Yeah, it's all there. And sometimes we should be so happy, I think, that we have found a spiritual path that actually makes sense, that hangs together, and that we have faith and confidence in something which is so beautiful. It's so difficult and so rare in the world to have confidence in these marvelous teachings. Uh, so you should really make the most out of this, uh, because it's very hard to actually give rise to these things. Uh. So this is the very foundation of the whole Buddhist practice. Uh, this is like getting the Kalyanamitta that stands at the very beginning of the path. Without that Kalyanamitta, without that confidence in good monastics and the Buddha specifically, the whole path becomes impossible. It arises out of this, and when it arises out of that, you gain faith in these teachings. When you have faith in the teachings, you practice accordingly. When you practice accordingly, the results come. And one day, oop, I'm an arahant now. Yeah? Just suddenly, oops. Okay, happened very fast. Uh, well, it, it, it looks fast in retrospect. When you're going there, it looks slowly. But in retrospect, it seems like the blink of an eye, yeah? Probably. And so fast, and then you are, it's all, all gone. But this is the foundation that is required. Uh, so build up that faith, yeah? Build up these things. Uh, keep on investigating the word of the Buddha. Keep on looking at these things. Uh, and as you do so, uh, you will gradually Hopefully, I don't know, hopefully you build up faith and confidence in these teachings, uh, at least if you read them in a wise and positive way. Uh, okay, that is enough for now. Let's have another break and we'll see you back again at the quarter to three here.